John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. In other webcasts, I've said some things about the historical background of the Anglo-Saxon epic poem Beowulf, and about the conventions of the epic genre, and about the aesthetic and prosodic features of the poem. Here, I'm going to talk about the plot and character development of Beowulf. The poem's narrative is structured in relation to Beowulf's three battles, although the accounts of the battles in themselves are not long. Much attention is given to the lead-in to the battles, to the honors that Beowulf accrues after his victories, and also to digressions that develop elements of character, such as the encounter between Beowulf and Unferth, comparison of Beowulf with the legend of Sigmund, or of the relationship between Beowulf and Wiglan. As I mentioned in another webcast, the poem begins with an account of the Danish royal genealogy showing how Hrothgar is descended from the founder, Shield Schiffing. Then we find out that Hrothgar has decided to build a grand mead hall at Hiero, a place where his followers are drinking and carousing every night. Grendel begins his nightly attacks, killing and maiming and generally destroying the festivities. Hearing of this trouble, Beowulf, a thane of Higelac, comes to Hrothgar's aid. Beowulf is the son of Ichthiel, and we learn that Ichthiel owed a debt to Hrothgar, and Beowulf seeks to discharge Ichthiel's debt by killing this monster. After some introductions, Hrothgar describes the terror of Grendel to Beowulf. Beowulf assures him that he can kill the monster. But one of Hrothgar's followers interrupts. Unferth is impatient with Beowulf's boasts. Beowulf responds to Unferth's challenge. Then quickly the narrative moves to the actual battle. The battle, after all of this, doesn't last very long. In short order, Beowulf defeats Grendel, tearing off his arm. Grendel slinks away to his lair, shortly to die. The association of Grendel with Cain introduces a Christian element into what is otherwise a pagan framework of values. What matters most to these characters are the values of the warrior culture. Strength, courage, comradeship, loyalty to one's leader. It may seem kind of trivial that Beowulf's heroic quest is undertaken so that Hrothgar's followers can drink and make merry in peace. But, as we will see, even by defeating Grendel, Beowulf hasn't actually made Hrothgar's world safe for drinking. It may well seem that everything in this first part of the poem leads to a very obvious foregone conclusion. But some dramatic tension arises in the encounter between Unferth and Beowulf. Unferth emerges as an envious character. By challenging Beowulf, he violates an important code of hospitality. And in Beowulf's response to Unferth, we learn that Unferth has killed his own brothers, probably out of envy and concern over an inheritance or a father's blessing. Some scholars point to this detail as another allusion to the biblical character of Cain, who also killed his own brother. Beowulf is obligated, it seems, by the pagan warrior code to respond, and he does so, successfully putting Unferth in his place. I'll read a few lines from this exchange. Here Unferth speaks. Are you that Beowulf Brecca bested when both of you bet on swimming the straits? Daring the deep in a dire struggle, risking your lives after rash boasting. No friend or foe, no man could deflect your foolhardy foray. Arms flailing, you each embrace the billowing stream. Span the sea lane with swift dipping hands and winded over the warring ocean. Winter-like waves were roiling the waters as the two of you toiled in the tumult of combers. For seven nights you strove to outswim him. But he was the stronger, and saw at sunrise the sea had swept him to Hyatherem shores. Breca went back to his own homeland, his burg on the bluff, stronghold of Brondings, fair fold, 
and wealthy. Then Beowulf spoke, son of Ecgiel, Listen, Unferth, my fuddled friend, brimful of beer, you blabber too much about Brecca's venture. I tell you the truth. My force in the flood is more than a match for any man who wrestles the waves. Boys that we were, brash in our youth and reckless of risk, both of us boasted that each one could swim the open ocean. So we set forth, stroking together, sturdily seaward, with swords drawn, hard in our hands, to ward off whalefish. Though swifter was he in those heaving seas, each of us kept close to the other, floating together those first five nights. Then the storm surges swept us apart, winter cold weather and warring winds drove from the north in deepening darkness. Rough waves rose and sea beasts raged, but my breast was wound in a woven mail shirt, hard and hand-linked, hemmed with gold. It kept those creatures from causing me harm. I was drawn to the depths, held fast by the foe, grim in his grasp. Yet granted a stab, I stuck in my sword point, struck down the horror. The mighty sea monster met his unmaker. Such close combat, or stark sword strokes, you have not seen, you or Brecca. No yarn has boasted how either of you two ever attempted so bold a deed, done with bright sword, though I would not brood a brother's bane if the killing of kin were all I accomplished. Having matched wits with Unferth and having defeated Grindel, Beowulf is rewarded by Hrothgar, and he enjoys a moment of honor and glory. But soon Beowulf will have to face danger again, an even greater threat than the monster Grindel, the wrath of Grindel's mother. And this is kind of interesting from a psychoanalytic perspective. Is it that the most fearful danger to this masculine warrior culture lies not in doing battle with the great monster, but in doing battle with the feminine? Here's the passage that introduces and describes Grindel's mother. It would soon be perceived plainly by all that one ill-wisher still was alive, maddened by grief. Grindel's mother, a fearsome female, bitterly brooding alone in her lair, deep in dread waters and cold currents, since Cain had killed the only brother born of his father. Marked by murder, he fled from mankind and went to the wastes. Doomed evildoers issued from him. Grindel was one, but the hateful Hellwalker found a warrior wakefully watching for combat in Yarrow. The monster met there a man who remembered strength would serve him, the great gift of God, faith in the all-wielder's favor and aid. By that he mastered the ghastly ghoul, routed, wretched, the hell-fiend fled, forlornly drew near his dreary death-place. Enraged and ravenous, Grindel's mother swiftly set out on a sorrowful journey to settle the score for her son's demise. She slipped into Hierot, Hall of the Ring Danes, where sleeping earls soon would suffer an awful reversal. Her onslaught was less by as much as a maiden's medal in war is less than a man's, wielding his weapon. The banded blade hammered to hardness, a blood-stained sword whose bitter stroke slashes a boar helm born into battle. In this attack on the Mead Hall, which takes place while Beowulf is sleeping, Grindel's mother is able to kill one of Hrothgar's most trusted followers. Hrothgar is beside himself with grief. Beowulf promises to take vengeance, and he ventures out alone to find the monster in her lair. There he confronts her, and while at first he is unable to kill her, using a sword given to him by Unferth, in the end he is able to kill her with the sword that he finds in her lair. With Grindel and Grindel's mother both dead, peace has come to Hrothgar's Hjerat, and Beowulf and his followers return to the land of the Yats, the kingdom of Higelac, in honor. In another webcast, I'll discuss the ending of the poem and offer some concluding remarks. Meanwhile, as always, if you have any questions or comments, send me an email.